everyone, this is a new and improved video on the kidney. In terms of how I'm going to teach you the topic of the kidney, we're going to look at the structure of the kidney, how it's involved in osmoregulation, so that's the control of water levels, and we're also going to discuss its role as an excretory organ. So you, hopefully you'll see we'll get a nice full picture. We'll also mention how kidney transplants and dialysis can be used to treat kidney failure. So starting with the kidney as an organ of excretion, to understand its role, we first of all need to define excretion, which is the removal of waste products of metabolism. Now, metabolic reactions are basically a fancy way of saying all the reactions that take place in our cells, in our bodies. So when we say that the kidney is an organ of excretion, basically we mean that it removes metabolic waste. I'm now gonna list some other organs which also deal with excretion. They are the lungs, which excrete carbon dioxide, they are the skin, which excretes sweat, and lastly, the kidney, which excretes urea. And that's what we're going to talk about once we've looked at the structure of the kidney. So the kidneys are two small organs, fist-sized, which are located towards the bottom of your back. If we look at their overall structure, the outermost layer is known as the cortex. Then we have a middle layer known as the medulla, which is where you'll find the nephrons, a very important part of the kidney, which we'll discuss later. There's also the renal pelvis that basically holds everything in place, as well as the renal artery, which supplies oxygenated blood to the kidney and the renal vein, which removes deoxygenated blood from the kidney. The ureter leads from the pelvis down and carries urine to the bladder for storage. The urethra is the name of the vessel which takes the urine from the bladder and transports it out of the body. So that's a really nice overview of the kidney. Now we need to focus in on that medulla, the middle section of the kidney, and look at its role in carrying out excretion as well as osmoregulation. So the medulla is full of thousands of tiny structures called the nephron, and you do need to know the structure of the nephron. Notice that there's a capillary which enters the kidney nephron, known as the glomerulus, which you do need to know the name of, which exists within the starting point of the nephron, which is the Bowman's capsule. So if you can envisage the blood flowing into the glomerulus, then there is the glomerulus, that network of blood capillaries, and then the blood flows on. One thing to be aware of is that the vessel coming into the glomerulus is wider than the one leaving, and that generates a pressure which actually helps to force small molecules out of the blood, so out of the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. And this is actually known as ultrafiltration, a very important process that takes place within the kidney nephron. So if we were to define ultrafiltration, we'd say that small molecules such as glucose, urea, ions and water are forced out of the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule under pressure. Notice things like protein don't move across that glomerulus, they don't cross the basement membrane that exists between the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, and that's because those proteins are too big. Now the vessel coming into the glomerulus is wider than the one leaving, and that is what generates that all-important pressure, forcing those small molecules across that basement membrane. The next part of the nephron we enter is known as the proximal convoluted tubule, otherwise known as the first coil tube. Look at its shape and you can see where they got the name from. Now, the proximal convoluted tubule is where selective reabsorption takes place. You do need to know all about selective reabsorption. This is effectively the body taking back the useful substances back into the blood because remember when we've entered the nephron we're no longer part of the main bloodstream so at this point we need those useful products to be returned to the blood so if we ask ourselves what selective reabsorption is well it's the taking back of all of the glucose and some of the ions back into the blood now because these substances move against their concentration gradients from low to high we say that this takes place by active transport and that there's a requirement of energy. Notice that urea is a waste product. Remember that's a waste product of the breakdown of proteins into amino acids. Remember we can't store excess amino acids. They get converted to ammonia, which is toxic, which then gets converted to urea. So it's these molecules of urea that we need to lose from the body and that's why the urea stays within the nephron. The next bit of the nephron is known as the loop of Henle. Don't worry too much about this, this just further concentrates the contents of the nephron and then following the loop of Henle we have the distal convoluted tubule, otherwise known as the second coil tube. Again, not too much to worry about here. Then we reach the collecting duct and that flows directly to the ureter, to the bladder, so that the urea 
in the urine can be excreted. So really what I want you to take away from the nephron is that two main things happen here. Number one, ultrafiltration between the glomerulus and bone's capsule boundary. Number two, selective reabsorption, which takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule where it moves glucose and ions back into the blood by active transport. And so that's really an outline of the kidney's role in excretion. Now what about its role as an organ involved in osmoregulation? Osmo means to do with water, so we're controlling water levels. So we know very clearly that we need to control our water levels. This is an example of homeostasis, but how is that done? So we're going to look at two scenarios. One when we've had too little water to drink and one when we've had too much. So let's take the scenario when we've had too little water to drink. First of all, we need to detect the low water levels of the blood and that's the role of osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus in the brain. So the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus detect low water levels and they send a message to the pituitary gland located in the base of the brain to secrete more of the hormone ADH. Now ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone and therefore if you know what a diuretic is, it's something that makes you pee, antidiuretic hormone will therefore prevent you from peeing as much. So we've had little water to drink, our osmoreceptors are registering low blood water levels so therefore more ADH will be released from the pituitary gland. That ADH is a hormone which means it's carried in the blood to the kidney and it specifically acts on the collecting duct of the nephron and makes it more permeable to water, which does need pointing out in your exam answer. This means that more water can be reabsorbed from the collecting duct back into the blood, meaning that less water is available to produce urine. So if we consider the urine in this situation, it will be low in volume, concentrated, and quite dark in color and fairly smelly to be honest. Now let's look at the opposite scenario. So when we've had too much water to drink, let's go through all those steps again. So this time the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus will detect high water levels in the blood. The pituitary gland will therefore secrete less ADH into the blood. Less ADH arrives at the collecting duct in the nephron. The collecting duct walls are less permeable to water, meaning that less water is reabsorbed back into the blood and therefore more water is available to produce urine, resulting in urine which is high in volume, light in colour and dilute as opposed to concentrated. And so that's the role of ADH. We're now going to move on to look at dialysis and kidney transplants. Now, although you probably won't see in a lot of specs that they actually point out dialysis directly, they could ask you about dialysis indirectly by testing your knowledge of osmosis and diffusion and active transport. So that's why I'm going to mention that here because I want to cover all scenarios. So if your kidney fail, fails, this is going to be a bit of a nightmare because it means that you can't control your water levels appropriately and you can't remove urea from your blood. So that's where kidney dialysis comes in. It's a pretty unpleasant procedure. You have to have it around four times a week for at least four hours, depends on the patient's needs. And effectively, they remove all your blood from your body and it gets cleaned. But how does this take place? Well, there's a special partially permeable membrane that your blood flows against that has a dialysis fluid on the other side of it. And the doctors are very careful in controlling the contents of that dialysis fluid. For example, it contains absolutely no urea. So if you imagine your blood flowing past this membrane with all the urea in it, and then it passes this membrane that on the other side has no urea in it whatsoever. Well, that means that the urea passes by diffusion across that partially permeable membrane and is therefore removed from the blood because it moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. They could ask you how dialysis is similar to osmosis. Well, look, it involves a partially permeable membrane. Sometimes water moves depending on your body's requirement for water. So you'll often find that a lot of that filtrate produced by the dialysis machine will contain a huge amount of water. They often control the glucose and the iron content of the dialysis fluid and make it very similar to that found in the blood and that ensures that glucose and ions do not leave your blood so that they can be returned to your body because after all you need that glucose for respiration to help you release energy. So that's a really quick overview of how dialysis works. Remember because it is three to four times a week it does take such a long time it is a bit of a nightmare. There's also a risk of infection because you need to be injected multiple times and it also loses effectiveness over time. So there's another solution, which is the kidney transplant. 
This is good because it does away from the need for dialysis. It means that people can get on with their lives a bit better. However, you've got issues with kidney transplants. Number one, shortage of donors. Number two, often the transplants aren't a match, so you need to be on immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of your life. And number three, there's always a potential risk from open surgery. Right, I'm gonna answer some past paper questions now on the kidney. I hope you found this video super helpful and don't forget to subscribe or like. The human kidney removes urea from the blood. Name two other substances the kidney removes from the blood. We've just been discussing this. It's both water and ions. The diagram shows a simple kidney machine that uses dialysis to remove urea from the blood. So we've got the blood leaving the patient. The blood travels out of the person's arm and we can see this partially permeable dialysis tubing that the blood flows along and that's surrounded by dialysis fluid. Dialysis allows small molecules to be removed from the blood. This is done by passing the dialysis solution over the tube containing the blood. The small molecules move from an area of high concentration to a region of low concentration. Give one way in which dialysis is similar to diffusion. Well, hopefully you've identified the diffusion definition there, which is in both there's a movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Give one way in which dialysis is similar to osmosis. So what is osmosis? Well, it's the movement of water molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration across a partially permeable membrane. And look up, we know we've got that partially permeable dialysis tubing. So how are they similar? It involves water and a partially permeable membrane. Describe how the kidney machine removes urea from the blood. Again, I just talked about this. Remember, it uses diffusion to move urea from an area of high concentration in the blood to an area of low concentration in the dialysis fluid. Another function of the kidney machine is to maintain normal blood glucose concentration. Suggests how the concentration of glucose in the dialysis solution helps to maintain a normal glucose concentration in the blood. Well, it makes sense to stop the glucose leaving the blood, that the concentration of glucose both within the fluid and the blood is the same. However, if the concentration of glucose in the blood is too high, therefore it makes sense that the dialysis fluid is lower than that to enable that glucose to leave. Describe two processes that take place in the kidney but not in the kidney machine. This is really just asking about ultrafiltration. As we know, that takes place within the kidney nephron. And selective reabsorption. And so for the third and fourth mark, we're just going to define those. So we're going to say with ultrafiltration, small molecules, e.g. urea, water and ions leave the glomerulus and enter the Bowman's capsule in terms of selective reabsorption remember things like glucose and ions leave the proximal convoluted tubule and re-enter the blood by active transport. Kidney failure can be treated by transplanting a healthy donor kidney into the patient. The procedure involves connecting two blood vessels and a tube to the transplanted kidney. Name the two blood vessels in the tube. So, because it's to do with the kidney, it's a renal. Artery, remember, carries oxygenated blood to the kidney. 
the renal vein will remove deoxygenated blood. The tube is the ureter because remember that connects the kidney to the bladder. Suggest why the transplanted kidney is placed in the lower abdomen instead of the kidney's usual location. Well, think about the practicalities here. First of all, there'll be easier access if it's in the lower abdomen. And the transplanted kidney will be closer to the bladder. The diagram shows the kidney nephron with parts labelled A, B and C. The table lists events that take place in the nephron. Complete the table by giving the letter of the part where each event takes place. Ultrafiltration, remember that takes place here. So that's A. Glucose reabsorption takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule, which is why that's B. The photograph shows the flower called a dandelion. If a person picks this flower and then licks their fingers, they will want to urinate. This is because the plant produces a chemical called a diuretic that affects the regulation of the water content of the blood. Suggest how this diuretic causes more urine to be produced. So we're going to be thinking about a similar situation to when you've had too much water. So remember the pituitary gland is going to be important and it's going to secrete less ADH. which means less ADH travels in the blood to the collecting duct. The walls of the collecting duct are therefore less permeable to water. So less water is reabsorbed and therefore more urine is produced.